It is my joy to bring the word to you again this evening. I'm grateful for the series that we have going on this summer. It's a joy to think through the different attributes of our gracious and glorious God. And so that is what we have been doing. We have looked at many of the perfections of God. Our purpose during these few months has been to take time out of our week and to observe our great and glorious God and think through how His character affects our lives. And hopefully as Jonathan, Justin, and myself have attempted to present the God of the Bible as He declares Himself to be, that you have been able to see him on the pages of Scripture and that your worship of him has deepened. And hopefully your understanding of God has continued to be clarified because that's what happens in our lives until the moment we see Jesus face to face. And then even for all of eternity, we will continue to plumb the depths of the glories and the riches of God and who he is. And hopefully you have been encouraged and challenged to grow deeper in your love and your service and your obedience to God as we have studied these attributes. Well, I want to continue tonight to examine our great God by looking at his perfection of faithfulness in a text that is considered certainly a classic on this subject. So if you would, please turn in your Bibles with me to Lamentations chapter 3. Lamentations chapter 3. And the focal point uh, of this text that we will gear in towards this evening is verses 20 through 24, and I will set that before us. Surely my soul remembers and is bowed down within me. This I recall to my mind, therefore I have hope. The Lord's loving kindnesses indeed never cease. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I have hope in him. Affliction, devastation, trials, difficulties, disappointments, tragedies. We have all experienced these things in one form or another in our lives. It will be five years ago next month that I received the news that my childhood best friend had passed away tragically. My friend Jason and I were always together growing up, even to the point where we were young adults. He was married, had three young children. He was an electrician by trade. One day, he was on the job site doing what He did as an electrician, and his brother walked past where he should be standing, and there he was laying on the ground. And as he checked on him, he realized that he had passed from this life. After an investigation as to what had happened to him, the realization came that he had been electrocuted, some faulty wiring that he had been dealing with, and, and he had been electrocuted right there on the job site. And he left behind his parents and his brother and sister and his wife and his three young children who were absolutely devastated. I remember at the funeral being there with them and his wife was just overwhelmed with grief and the thought of, what am I going to do? (laughs) Living as fallen humans on this planet inevitably brings these sorts of things into our lives. In fact, if we adhere to a biblical theology, we know that God has ordained these things at different times and for different reasons in our lives for the purpose of his glory. Our passage this evening deals with a prophet who has been afflicted along with his people because of their disobedience to God by way of their continual idolatry. And this text explains to us how a proper understanding of God and his faithfulness brings the prophet and the believing remnant hope in the midst of crisis. 
in order for us to get an understanding of the truth in this passage that we might rely upon God and his faithful character in the midst of devastation and hardship, I want us to examine four actions to embrace concerning the faithfulness of God in the midst of affliction. Four actions to embrace concerning the faithfulness of God in the midst of affliction. The first action that must be embraced is found in verse 20, and it is this. Resign your heart to a humble posture. Resign your heart to a humble posture. Verse 20, surely my soul remembers and is bowed down within me. When tragedy strikes, the first action we must take is to humble ourselves before God. And this is a humility which can only be produced by God alone. You understand that the natural inclination of the human heart is pride, it's self-reliance, it's self-confidence. I can do it, or I can be all that I can be. I, I have the strength. I have the ability. I am capable. These are the mentalities that we are born with, and they are also the mentalities that our culture cultivates in us to the nth degree. Dependence, neediness, and brokenness are all characteristics that are looked down upon in our current setting. But in order for a person to come to the place where they will rely upon the faithfulness of God and therefore have hope, which is sure and anchored in the character of God, they must come to a head with humility. Humility must conquer. Humility must prevail. Humility must be preeminent. Well, this is the point where Jeremiah has come to in our passage. You see, verse 20 of Lamentations chapter 3 represents a turning point in these poems of complaint by the prophet who has just witnessed a horrifying, devastating destruction of both his people and his city. This prophet has been brought low. In fact, it's very likely that Jeremiah, while constructing this set of poems of of complaint, these, these laments, the book of Lamentations as we know it, it's very likely that he was sitting on a high hill overlooking Jerusalem in its complete destruction when he penned these poems. This man was devastated. He was overwhelmed by what the reality of his life had become. This people, God's chosen people, who he knew them to be because he was their prophet, had been overcome with this great and horrifying devastation. And it is at this point in verse 20 that Jeremiah realizes that he and his people are absolutely dependent upon this God who has just poured out his wrath in an indescribable way on his covenant people. How did Jeremiah arrive at this point of complete dependence and humility? Well, let me give a couple of suggestions, and then we'll look at the text. First of all, understand this, that I I believe it's true that God often uses affliction as a necessary component in the process of humbling someone. We know this experientially in our lives. We know this as as we work through the pages of Scripture that often there is a necessary affliction that comes in the process of bringing people, you and I, to humility. And as pride is often our deepest sin issue, so was the case for the nation of Israel. I want to retrace a little bit of uh, of the story of Israel's pride and arrogance and rebellion that that brought Jeremiah to this point in verse 20 in Lamentations chapter 3. We know, first of all, in Joshua chapter 1, and you can flip over there. We'll be there for just a moment. Joshua chapter 1, we know uh, that the nation of Israel had just been led out of Egypt, and they had just wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. And that this point, at the end of Deuteronomy and Joshua chapter 1, there's a transition of power that takes place, and Joshua is commanded to take this nation and to lead them into the promised land. He is to cross over the Jordan River, and he is to lead them in to the promised land. Joshua chapter 1, verse 11 
Joshua, he's in verse 10, commanding the officers of the people. He says, pass through the midst of the camp and command the people saying, prepare provisions for yourselves. For within three days, you are to cross this Jordan to go in to possess the land which the Lord your God is giving you to you to possess it. Verse 13, remember the word which Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you saying, the Lord your God gives you rest and will give you this land. Your wives, your little ones, and your cattle shall remain in the land which Moses gave you beyond the Jordan. But you shall cross before your brothers in battle array all your valiant warriors, and you shall help them until the Lord gives your brothers rest as he gives you. And they also possess the land which the Lord your God is giving them. Then you shall return to your own land and possess that which Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you beyond the Jordan toward the sunrise. Yahweh commanded Joshua to possess the land that is promised to them, and they are to do this by driving out and destroying everyone who is living in the land of Canaan, as the book of, uh, of Joshua is all about, this, uh, this conquest and then division of the land. They were to go in and take over this land that God had given them. That was their responsibility. That was what they were commanded to do. But then turn over to Judges chapter 1. Judges chapter 1, verse 27. But Manasseh, one of the tribes, did not take possession of Beth Sheen and its villages, or Tanak and its villages, or the inhabitants of Dor and its villages, or the inhabitants of Ibleam and its villages, or the inhabitants of Megiddo and its vi villages. So the Canaanites persisted in living in that land. And then just a couple chapters over in chapter 3, verse 5, you have the continuation of this happening. The sons of Israel lived among the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And they took their daughters for themselves as wives and gave their own daughters to their sons and served their gods. The sons of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and forgot the Lord their God and served the Baals and the Asheroth. Then verse 8, Then the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, so that he sold them into the hands of Cushan, Rashathaim, the king of Mesopotamia. And the sons of Israel served Cushan, Rashathaim, eight years. Israel does not obey the command to possess and conquer. And their disobedience leads them to being neighbors with the Canaanites and then ultimately to their sin cycle of idolatry because they neighbored with the Canaanites, they became fond of their women, and so they intermarried with them, they began to have children, and then they started serving their gods. And so this sin cycle began. They ended up bowing their knees to Baal and turned away from God. And their pride was seen in the fact that they thought they could do things their own way uh, apart from Yahweh's command. He said, go in and conquer this land. Drive them out. Kill all of them. Wipe them off the planet. And take over the land that I am giving you. This is your promised land that I promised to Abraham, your forefather. This is your land. Go in, take possession of it. I'm going to go before you and I'm going to make sure it takes place but they thought they could have it both ways. They could go in, they could conquer some, they could live with others. And so their sin cycle continued on and on, even through the period of the judges as God brought judges to the nation to, to judge them and to lead them out of the particular predicaments they got in because of their sin. Their pride led them to want to be like other nations and live under a king instead of allowing Yahweh to be their king, which that was the purpose, that was the goal, that's what God wanted. You see, the nation of Israel was this nation that the rest of the world was to come and to look in upon and to see the glory of God radiated from these people and to be attracted to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and to bow their knee to him. But they wanted to be like other nations. They wanted to live under a king. This ultimately caused a divided kingdom and, and wicked king after wicked king came and led God's people astray. 
Throughout the period of the kings, God would raise up a righteous king every now and then to continue to show that he was a merciful God to his people. Finally, Yahweh judged his covenant people as a means of discipline, but also to preserve his glory from continuing to be maimed by his people. They were to radiate his glory to the nations, but they were instead dragging his name through the mud before the people of the world. And so this gives us the background to the affliction that Yahweh brought on his people by the hand of the Babylonians. The Babylonians invaded Jerusalem in 586 BC. They conquered the city. They took slaves back to Babylon. We've been studying the book of Daniel on Sunday nights. You know that they got there in that way. The book of Lamentations is written because of that invasion. The prophet Jeremiah looked upon the devastation of this city and the fact that his people had been taken away. And he wrote these poems of lament. And the majority of this book of poems is the prophet's complaint against Yahweh for the affliction that he and his people are in the midst of enduring. He's trying to work it out in his mind. And throughout the complaint, descriptions of this affliction are given. And just looking at the, the immediate Context of, uh, of chapter 3 gives us enough description to understand how this prophet got to the point of humility. Look at verse 1 in chapter 3. He said, I'm a man who has seen affliction because of the rod of his wrath. He has driven me and made me walk in darkness and not in light. Surely against me he has turned his hand repeatedly all the day. He has caused my flesh and my skin to waste away. He has broken my bones. He has besieged me and encompassed me with bitterness and hardship. In dark places, he made me dwell like those who had long been dead. He has walled me in so that I cannot go out. He has made my chain heavy. Even when I cry out and call for help, he shuts out my prayer. He has blocked my ways with hewn stone. He has made my paths crooked. He is to me like a bear lying in wait, like a lion in secret places. He has turned aside my ways and torn me to pieces. He has made me desolate. He bent his bow and set me as a target for the arrow. He made the arrows of his quiver to enter my inward parts. I've become a laughingstock to all my people. They're mocking song all the day. He has filled me with bitterness. He has made me drunk with wormwood, and he has broken my teeth with gravel. He has made me cower in the dust. My soul has been rejected from peace. I have forgotten happiness. So I say my strength has perished. So has my hope in the Lord. Remember my affliction and my wandering, the wormwood and the bitterness. These things are fresh in Jeremiah's mind. As he says in verse 20, my soul continually remembers it. My soul continually remembers it. It's fresh in his mind because Lamentations is written within just a few years of the actual invasion. This this weeping prophet is experiencing this turmoil firsthand. Secondly, Jeremiah figures out that humility is necessary. So often affliction is used in the process to make one humble. He also figures out that, that humility is necessary. Humility exposes our absolute dependence upon God. This prophet was was brought to humility by Yahweh so that his hope in Yahweh could be revived. Isaiah chapter 66, verse 2, the second part says, and this is Yahweh speaking, but to this one I will look, to him who is humble and contrite in spirit, and to him who trembles at my word. See, Jeremiah, in his completely humble state, here in verse 20, as his soul is bowed down within him, starts to begin to recall God's faithfulness in his life. Are you experiencing the affliction of God right now? Is it possible that God is bringing you to a point of complete trust in his sovereignty and seeking to revive your soul? Is it Time for you to repent of your pride so that you might begin to recall God's continuing faithfulness in your life. 
This begs the question, what if I am humble before Yahweh because of his affliction? What will that produce in me? Where does this humility lead? We see that in verse 21. It's the second action we must embrace concerning God's faithfulness in the midst of affliction, and it is this. It is to recall to your mind the revealed truth. To recall to your mind the, the revealed truth, as verse 21 says, This I recall to my mind, therefore I have hope. Now that the prophet has been humbled by the affliction brought upon him by Yahweh, he will be able to see what results from dependence upon Yahweh, which is hope. This word hope, used both here and in verse 24, has the idea of patient endurance. It means to tarry or or to wait. It implies that there is a worthy cause that is generating the endurance necessary to continue. So what has caused the prophet to be filled with hope? Well, the answer comes in the first part of verse 21. And if you notice, the second part, the second half of the verse is completely dependent upon the first statement that is seen. And we see that by the word therefore. So he says, this I recall to mind. And then the second part is dependent upon that statement. Therefore, I have hope. This endurance is based on what the prophet recalls to his mind. The word used here for mind in the Hebrew is usually the word to communicate to us uh, the idea of the entire person, the inner person. It is usually translated heart. This is the seat of all human emotions and feelings and, and intellect. This is your inner man. The best way to understand this in our text is as the intellect, which is explained by the idea of remembering back in verse 20. You see, knowledge drives emotions. It drives feelings. It drives actions. What is placed into one's mind is the root cause of what takes place in a person's life. You see, the mind is the control center of the entire operating system of your life. What you think upon, what you think about, influences you. Proverbs 4.23 says that out of the heart, same word used for mind in our text, out of the heart flows the issues of life. The mind is the center of the person, and what goes into it will determine one's life. This is why Romans 12 says that we are not to be conformed to this world, but we are to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. So what Jeremiah is saying here is that what he has chosen to think upon has given him hope in the midst of the dire circumstances of his life. What you choose to fill your mind with will influence your attitude, it will influence your words, it will influence your actions, and it will influence your overall approach to life. When you are in the midst of a dreadful situation, what do you turn to? What do you turn to? What do you fill your mind with? When something bad happens in your life, what's the first thing you do? Where does your mind go? Do you find yourself in a deep, depressed state? Woe is me. How did I get here? What's going to happen now? Do you turn to some sort of addictive substance that helps fill that void that comes when dire circumstances come in your life? What do you turn to? What or who do you think upon when this happens to you? What do you turn to for hope in the midst of crisis? We know the answer we want to give, but what's the reality of your life? When things happen, when affliction comes, when hardship prevails, where do you go? Where does your mind go in those circumstances? 
See, Jeremiah explains to us that in the midst of the issues of life, that there is only one person to fix our minds upon. There is only one person who is perfect. There is only one person who is merciful. There is only one person who is loving. And there is only one person who is absolutely faithful. And that is the God of the universe. He is the one who has lovingly sent his son to demonstrate his mercy and his faithfulness to us. He is the God who has brought this affliction upon this prophet for the purpose of revealing his enduring faithfulness to him. Yahweh is the covenant name for God. This name expresses his complete holiness and faithfulness. Yahweh is is the God who will deliver this hope to the afflicted prophet. It is Yahweh and his faithfulness is what is to be thought upon and meditated upon in order to bring biblical hope in your life, even this evening. So what exactly does the prophet think upon and consider? And what should we think upon and consider concerning the attributes of God's faithfulness? Why does Jeremiah, why is he able to, after all of this, at the end of verse 23, why is he able to cry out, great is your faithfulness? Well, these questions bring us to the third action that we must embrace concerning God's faithfulness, and it is this. Remember the love and the faithfulness of God. Remember the love and the faithfulness of God. Verse 22 says, The Lord's loving kindnesses indeed never cease. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. What does Jeremiah set his mind upon in the midst of his affliction? Well, he sets his mind upon remembering the love and the faithfulness of God. Why does his mind go here? Why does it go here? Because this is the only true stability that provides genuine hope. Friends, this is the only place that you can go to stabilize your thoughts, your emotions, and your motivations when your world is shattering around you. This is the only place you can go right here. To say that God is is faithful is to say that God is completely reliable to operate according to his completely true character. He is dependent. He is reliable. And his reliability is based on the fact that he is God and that he is true. There is no falsehood in God. He is truth. Therefore, he is completely reliable. He is completely accurate in all of his words and all of his deeds. Listen to a few of these passages that describe the different outworking of this perfection of faithfulness. Numbers 23. God is not a man that he should lie nor a son of man that he should repent? Or has he said and he will not do it? Or has he spoken and he will not make it good? Or Psalm 33, 4, for the word of the Lord is upright. All his work is done in faithfulness. Exodus chapter 34, verse 6, then the Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, compassion, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in loving kindness and truth. Psalm 36, 5, Your loving kindness, O Lord, extends to the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Psalm 18, 2 and 3, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock, in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call upon the Lord, who is worthy to be praised, and I am saved from my enemies. God's faithfulness means he can be trusted in these difficult times. He is our rock and our refuge. Hebrews 10, 23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. Why? For he who promised is faithful. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, a favorite verse. Of many people I know, no temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man, and God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able The with the temptation will provide the way of escape also so that you will be able to endure it. God's 
perfect and complete reliability that is based on his character, his, the fact that we can depend upon him because he is indeed truth. He is God. Works itself out in so many ways in our lives. And as you look back at verse 22 of our text, you can see that Jeremiah describes two aspects of Yahweh's faithfulness here in this verse. First, we see his loving kindnesses is how it's translated in our text. Now, if you've been around countryside for any time at all, you know that this is the Hebrew word hesed. And although it is generally translated in our English Bibles as loving kindness, the best understanding of this word is that it is Yahweh's covenant love for his people. This love is not based on anything Israel was or anything Israel did. Rather, this love is the, choice that, this is the choice of Yahweh alone, and it is enduring, and it is completely faithful. This love is rooted in his character. However, this word is in the plural here in verse 22, which depicts for us aspects of this covenant love that Jeremiah is recalling to his mind. Jeremiah is getting specific here as he begins to recall specific things to his mind that help generate hope in his life. You see, Jeremiah remembers that God has been faithful to his people to always preserve a remnant even in the midst of judgment. He remembers that Yahweh protected them from complete destruction even in the midst of their idolatry. Jeremiah remembers that Yahweh made a covenant with his forefathers concerning the preservation of his chosen people. Jeremiah remembers God's mercy upon his very life, even preserving him from physical death at the hand of his adversaries. This word is also translated mercies, which depict the aspect of covenant love that withholds judgment even when it is deserved. Yahweh should have wiped out this people. But in his mercy, he sent them into captivity to bring about repentance and correction for the purpose of restoring his remnant. And the text tells us that this covenant love and all of its aspects never ceases. It is eternal. It, it carries with it a promise from Almighty God. This idea of, of, of never ceasing also extends to his people not being consumed. You see, our eternal destiny is secured in the mercy of God. It is secured in the hesed of God. This covenant love also extends to us as the church because it is God's character and it is God's nature. We have been chosen for salvation from before the foundation of the world, and we have been given salvation in Jesus Christ because of God's loving kindness and because of God's mercy. And it will never cease. Because it never ceases, we will never be consumed. Well, the second part of God's faithfulness that, that Jeremiah is reflecting upon is the fact that his compassions never fail. The idea in the Hebrew here is for this word translated compassions is the idea of tender love. Now, this is the type of tender love that a mother has for her unborn child. Now, she's going to do everything she can to protect that child, both in the womb and then when it is born. She's going to nurture him and to be tender towards him. She loves that baby more than anything else on this planet. This word is also an affectionate love that displays itself in terms of, of pitying and, and showing kindness and blessing toward another person. This is the tender affection that a man shows to his wife. You see, Yahweh pities his people in their distress. And he shows kindness and affection to them because it is part of his faithfulness, and that faithfulness is rooted in his character. And by the way, 
this pity, this kindness, this affection, it never fails. God is completely committed to his people who belong to him. You know, we can only speculate how how Yahweh expressed that to Jeremiah throughout the course of his ministry, but we know he did because this, along with his covenant love, are what Jeremiah set his mind upon in the midst of distress to bring hope to his soul and cause him to endure for the glory of God. This love and kindness is renewed every morning. Every day we wake up on this earth as children of God, we experience a renewed and refreshed expression of the mercies of God in our lives. Even when your circumstances don't line up and and when your world has been turned upside down and you're struggling to find which way is up again, you can be assured that God is faithfully loving you with an endless love and an irresistible kindness. And this is also true this evening. If you have been living in sin and have repented, you stand forgiven based on the faithfulness of God realized in the person and work of Jesus Christ. You can move forward each day in continual dependence upon the mercy of God in your life because he continually refreshes us every morning with his mercy and his hope. And the eternal non-consuming love of God and his kindness and affection should consume our minds because if you are a believer sitting in those chairs this evening, he has and he is expressing those things to you at this very moment. You might be blinded by sin and pride and not seeing them, but every breath he gives you and the very fact that you are not under his eternal wrath and headed to an eternity with him are evidences of this in your life. And if we, like the prophet, can see our pride and repent from it and fall in complete humility and dependence on our knees before Yahweh and fill our minds with the unending faithfulness of his character, we too will cry out in the midst of affliction, hardship, disappointment, devastation, and even complete and utter disaster. Great is your faithfulness. Well, this brings us to the final section and the final action that we must embrace, which is seen in verse 24, and it is this. We must revere God as the all-satisfying portion. We must revere God as the all-satisfying portion. It says in verse 24, the Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I have hope in him. After remembering and thinking and meditating upon the faithfulness of Yahweh's character, the prophet's soul is full because the Lord is his portion and his inheritance. He is completely filled with the person of God. The character of God has overwhelmed this man. And ultimately, it's that simple. God must be your portion. That is to say, he must be your contentment. He must be your hope. He must be your fulfillment. He must be your sufficiency. One author explains God as our portion like this, a full and complete expression of all that his relationship with God guarantees him. A full and complete expression of all that his relationship with God guarantees him. He is overwhelmed with who God is and what God has promised to do in his life. When you are filled with the person of God, his character and and the demonstration of that character, your mind will not be set on whatever difficulty is going on in your life, but rather it will be set upon God and his goodness and his faithfulness. And that's where you and I need to be. Because he says this will bring hope. This is the promise of God. Set your mind upon God and his faithfulness. Recall the many ways in which he has been faithful to you throughout your Christian life. Because there have been many. 
Every single day is an expression of his faithfulness to you. As you wake up and you open your eyes and you see the new day upon you, that is God's faithfulness in your life. As you go through difficult times and God sustains you and God brings you through the backside, that's God's faithfulness in your life. As God provides for your needs day in and day out uh, of our mundane lives, God is expressing his faithfulness to you. Know that he has a purpose in all of this and that his purpose is good. Fill your mind with the promises contained in his word for believers and your hope will be secure in that. His unending love and unending faithfulness, when it is reflected upon in the way that the prophet reflects upon it here in verses 22 and 23, it will bring hope in your life. As we close tonight, let me challenge you with a few things. First of all, if you're not a believer, you need to repent from your sin and believe upon Jesus Christ for salvation. Listen, he lived the life that you were supposed to live and he died the death that you deserve to die. And he died to satisfy the Father's wrath against sin. And by coming to him, you can be assured that that payment of your sin has been satisfied in Christ. Repent, believe upon Jesus Christ, his person and his work, fully committing yourself to him as Lord, and you will be saved. You come before the Lord, you throw yourself at his mercy. God, I'm a sinner. I need your forgiveness and your grace. I want to follow you with my life. You embrace the Lord Jesus Christ as Lord. This is the only way, friend, that you will experience the faithfulness that we have talked about this evening. This faithfulness, everything we've talked about, Jeremiah, he was a believer. He was a believer. Unbeliever doesn't experience faithfulness in this same way. They have the, certainly, they have the common grace of God that he expresses his kindness to them, but But this faithfulness we talked about tonight, it's for a Christian. And if you don't, if you don't repent, if you don't come to Christ as your Lord, understand that there is only one side of God's eternal faithfulness that you will experience, and that is his faithful justice and his faithful wrath. You see, God is perfectly holy, and he must be faithful because it is a part of his character. It is who he is. He must be faithful to deal with sin. And he deals with sin in one of two ways. Either the sin is dealt with in Christ through his perfect, satisfying death upon the cross, or it is dealt with by punishing the sinner in hell, separating him from God for all of eternity. Those are the two ways that sin is dealt with. And so understand that, friend. If you are without Christ, throw yourself at the mercy of God tonight and respond to him by turning from your sin and embracing Christ as Lord. For those of you who do know Christ, which is certainly many of you in this room, I think 1 Peter chapter 1 gives us, in a sense, a kind of a sort of marching orders in consideration of our passage this evening. 1 Peter 1, verse 13, Peter says this, Therefore prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. See, men and women, whether it is the destroying hand of God that comes down to preserve his glory which took place with the nation of Israel. Or whether it is the disciplining hand of God that is described in Hebrews chapter 12 that comes down to produce repentance and correction in his children. 
or whether it is the trying hand of God seen in James chapter 2 that comes down to produce character and hope, we are given assurance that God is completely faithful and our hope stems from that. Our faithful God will work everything out for his glory and for the good of his people. Rest assured in him tonight. Let's pray. Father, we are astounded by your faithfulness. We know that it is who you are. It's rooted in your character. And we know, Father, from this text and from the example of this prophet, that it is the only stabilizing factor in our lives. Father, help us to exalt you for your faithfulness. We know the ultimate demonstration of that faithful love was Christ on the cross in our place, in our stead, paying, for the, paying the price for sin that we deserve to pay. And Father, we know that that faithfulness extends to us as Philippians 1 said, that he who began a good work in you will complete it to the day in which you return, Lord. We know that we will observe, we will, we will receive the, the fullness of your faithfulness to us as your people when we stand in your presence for all of eternity. So God, until that time, until you bring us home to be with yourself, I pray that we would recall to our minds day in and day out the matchless faithfulness of God and that we would endure for the glory of God. It's in the name of Christ we pray. Amen.